It's really wonderful to see such a robust turnout and uh, attendance here this evening. Certainly one of the pleasures and uh, benefits of my role in, in my capacity as director is that I get constantly introduced to new and exposed to new things. And I was just uh, conversing briefly before the lecture with our speaker this evening, who I think we've passed in the hallways perhaps a few times, but haven't really met before now. And so I'm actually, I, I'm going to be learning as much as anyone else in this room about some of the research that I've been hearing about for some time, but haven't yet had the chance to really um, see in any kind of detail. So I think we're really in for a treat this evening, and it's, it's a real pri privilege to be able to introduce our speaker and her subject this evening, Carolina Lopez Ruiz, a graduate of the University of Chicago, going back some time. I won't embarrass her by how many years it is, but certainly um, from the University of Chicago, she held an appointment at um, Ohio State up until from about 2005 up until about 2022. So she's also somewhat like myself, um, a returnee and also a new um, faculty member here at the University of Chicago in the Department of Classics as well as in the Divinity School. She's a professor of ancient Mediterranean religions and uh, mythologies of the uh, in the University of uh, Divinity School. Her research focus is in a wide range of topics including comparative mythology, cultural exchange in the ancient Mediterranean world, exploring the ideas about myth and narratives and religious practices act, which act as loci for cultural exchanges and provide mechanisms for groups in close contact to negotiate uh, tensions, adopt to change, and bolster their resilience. She has an incredible publication record. I'm not going to um, go through all of the details, but would like to just highlight some of the um, titles of some of the uh, books that she has uh, produced, including uh, ranging from Ox the Oxford Handbook of the Phoenician and Punic Mediterranean, uh, the uh, Gods, Heroes, and Monsters, a source book of Greek, Roman, and Near Eastern myths in translation, When the Gods Were Born, Greek Cosmogonies in the Near East, Colonial Encounters in Ancient Iberia, Phoenician, Greek, and Indigenous Relations. I really want to single out, however, her recent book, Phoenicians and the Making of the Mediterranean. I suspect we're going to hear a little bit more about that topic uh, this evening. To give you a little bit more flavor of some of her, the range of her scholarship reflected in articles ranging from titles like Local Experiences and Global Connections, Finding the, the Balance or the Resilience of a Non-People, the Case for a Reconstruction of Phoenician Identity, Knowledge Encounters with the Near Eastern World and Beyond. If you sense a theme here about intercultural connections and particularly between the classical or Aegean world, the Greek world, and the Near East, this is a very important, obviously from the Isaac uh, perspective of her research. One more, A Perilous Sailing and a Lion, Comparative Evidence for a Phoenician Afterlife Motif, published in the Journal of Ancient Near Eastern Religions. I could go on. There's an incredible range of scholarship and subject matter, a very distinguished scholar. We're really privileged to have uh, Carolina both at the University of Chicago and, and giving us a talk this evening. I'm going to struggle to pronounce the name of the site, probably best just to refer to Malaga, but she is perhaps known best to many in the room um, as uh, the co-director of the ongoing excavation project there, um, working collaboratively with uh, David Schloan, professor here in Isaac. So please welcome, join me in welcoming Carolina this evening. She's going to talk about the Phoenicians, the Phoenicians strike back. Please uh, join me in welcoming Carolina. Thank you for the invitation. I'm really honored to speak in these halls in which I've listened to a lot of lectures uh, as a student and as, as now as, as faculty. I also thank you for coming here because I know at this place there's always a lot of other things you could be uh, doing at any given time. Um, so I am going to uh, be talking about the Phoenicians kind of generally, uh, kind of give you context, tell you some things about my research, about why I think they're so fascinating and important as, a, as an object of study. Um, and then I will zoom in into the archaeological project that 
uh, Tim Harrison mentioned that, that I uh, lead with Professor David Sloan here and colleagues from Malaga. So uh, more or less, it might be half and half. I'm not sure, depends how the PowerPoint uh, goes. There are a lot of slides, so I will try to time it right. And then feel free to ask me questions either here or at the reception or send me an email if you don't get to or anything. I'm always happy to talk about Phoenicians. So who are the Phoenicians and why should we study them? Like everybody should study the Phoenicians according to, to me, obviously. Um, well, okay, very, very briefly just to situate in case somebody or anybody um, uh, doesn't know their background. Basically, we're talking about uh, Northwest Semitic speaking uh, people from the coast of uh, today's Lebanon, northern Israel, Biblos, Tyre, Sidon are names that resound right in the, in the history of the Phoenicians in many sources from biblical to classical sources. Uh, and as you can see in, this, in these maps, one of several maps I'm going to show you, um, in the green areas are actually, they, they kind of get very short of the areas where the Phoenicians settled, but it gives you an indication of the roots, the extent of the Mediterranean, and basically the Phoenicians uh, needed the first truly interconnected pan-Mediterranean ne network based on trading networks and trading posts, but also small settlements, some of which became larger, such as most famously Carthage, in uh, today's Tunisia, you can see there Carthage, Utica, right? They also settled in parts of uh, Western Sicily, Western Sardinia, and Southern Spain, and, and most of the coast of North Africa going all the way to the Atlantic and even the coast of Portugal. I'll show you another map that shows that better. So there, they are great objects of study for the Iron Age, especially that's when they appear in the stage of Mediterranean history around the turn of the first millennium BCE is when our sources start talking about, uh, about these people and their maritime enterprise, first with the Hebrew Bible and the Assyrian sources, and then, and then later on uh, with Homer, the Greek sources also talk about them. So they extend these networks and they interact with so many people, so many proto-urban, you know, archaic period um, groups such as the Greeks uh, at this time, such as the Etruscans, uh, Sardinians, and I, I, people from Iberia and North Africa and so on, Israel as well. So they really are uh, great to study the, the, the topic of uh, cultural exchange, cultural contact, um, and in that sense, they also provide an, an interesting frame for my, my, area of, my other area of, uh, of work, which is comparative mythology and, um, uh, and, and literatures, uh, in especially in Greek and Near Eastern interaction, as teased out in mythological themes. And one of the questions driving my, my scholarship is to what degree did this contact with Phoenicians in particular and Levantines more general uh, shape um, the Near Eastern, uh, the reception of Near Eastern culture and literature and mythology in ancient Greece. But today I will focus more on archaeology and material culture. They're also very interesting because they provide a, a, a kind of an alternative view of the Mediterranean, um, almost like from the southern part of it, um, that is a counterpoint to the you know the more traditional Hellenocentric and classicocentric and Europe centric uh, perspective of, of the Mediterranean. The goal, of course, is to integrate all of that, and there is no, you know, the, the, it shouldn't be like a dichotomy, right? Um, and then, the, at the la for the last point, it's also interesting that their activity and their presence is not uh, always linked to colonization. So we know that they are very active and living in, in small groups, pockets, trading posts, uh, or enclaves where they are integrated uh, in, in places, uh, say in the Aegean or, or in Italy, where they are not setting a, a colony. In other places, they are setting a colony, meaning a fuller grown settlement that they, that they govern in some way. But in other contexts, they are not. So basically, they are very flexible. Um, they provide a very flexible model of interaction and activity that is not imperial. It is colonial in some areas, but, but what kind of colonial? You know, it's kind of complex and it's not um, um, rigid in that way. So 
how did they manage to, to do this and to flourish for so many, for, for so many centuries, really, um, you know, uh, without much problem until they run against the Romans' interest? <laughs> That's a big question. So some of the challenges about the study of the Phoenicians are that, well, they fall between disciplines. Um, in a sense, I, my own work represents that, that falling uh, between disciplines and attempt to unite the, the, these disciplines. So um, classics, you know, historians who work on the Punic Wars, especially, or, or on Greek history, sometimes work on the Phoenicians. People who work on Hebrew Bible or on Assyrian sources sometimes work on the Phoenicians, ancient Near Eastern historians. And then, of course, Syria-Palestinian archaeology. Uh, they are part of that field. They are part of the field of Western Mediterranean archaeology of the Iron Age when you, if you move to the West. But that scholarship in the Far West and in the Near East doesn't always um, interact or communicate very well because they, are, they really belong to different disciplines, right? Near Eastern archaeology and Western Mediterranean archaeology, the methodologies are sometimes different, their approaches. So that's part of what I, I and others you know, try to... Uh, to do, to kind of link the dots. Um, and then the other big problem is how much they are mediated by other, other cultures' uh, sources. So they, we do have thousands of Phoenician inscriptions, but we have very few literary sources that we can call Phoenician. We have some, um, mostly in Greek, from later periods, but they're also, most of the information we have about the Phoenicians for the early period comes from other sources, be it Greek, later Roman, or again, Assyrian or biblical, right? So there is a problem of how to reconstruct their culture from within and being fair to their own image of themselves because we don't really know what the image of themselves was in that, in that way, um, in the way that we can work uh, with other groups, other cultures, uh, even though that's always a complex uh, task to try to reconstruct an in a group identity. So uh, because of that, there has been uh, some work in, in recent decades or so, yeah, within the, recent, the, the last decade uh, about like, questioning this, you know, uh, these issues and the idea of a Phoenician group identity uh, since we rely so much on others, other sources. So um, a work such, such as In Search of the Phoenicians kind of deconstructs uh, the idea of, of, of the Phoenicians in, as, a, um, as a cohesive uh, culture. Um, so I, I see that as a, you know, kind of a phase that any culture in antiquity has to go through to then kind of be reconstructed in, in the same way that we reconstruct to some degree any other culture, always in a sort of artificial way because you can, you know, it's always more complicated. But I think we can talk about the Phoenicians. In the end, we do. There is no way around language and its arbitrary nature, right? We use names. Um, so we can talk about the Phoenicians, uh, and this is just one possible way of describing them uh, as a seagoing, seafaring, very sea-oriented, Iron Age, a Canaanite group from the Lebanese coast and northern Israel. Um, distinct from other Northwest Semitic groups, that's Hebrews, Arameans, and so on, mostly because of the gods they worship, their religion, their rituals, uh, their maritime um, orientation, um, and a set of skills that are very prominent in their economy and that are recognized by others, such as metallurgy and luxury items and uh, crafts, certain crafts. And, but very importantly also because they share a language and a writing system that is peculiar uh, and distinct to them from a family of, of languages and scripts, but also peculiar. So we can relax. We can talk about Phoenicians in this sense without needing to get into the weeds of who did they really think they were or how do we define them further. But for those of you who like uh, DNA studies, <laughs> and with all the pitfalls that DNA studies can, can bring, I think it's just as a fun fact, I wanted to bring up these two cases of the so-called Birsa man on the left, looking very peaceful, and, <laughs> and Matan from Gadir in Spain, looking not so peaceful. Um, 
whose, uh, you know, whose skeletons were, uh, you know, uh, studied for DNA, for, for DNA, uh, um, DNA traits and also to reconstruct their, their faces. And they, they both happen to be from the same period, the 6th century BCE, when we have so many settlements and cemeteries and everything. So not surprisingly, just to bring up a kind of a fun fact, the studies, again, we thunk it in, into the weeds of um, how to read those studies, but the studies show or argue that in both cases you have uh, a, a type of DNA strand that goes back to what you would expect from the Near East, like um, what is attested in remains from Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, uh, Palestine, so on, and in both cases. And another strand, especially the mitochondrial DNA in the case of Matan, um, which is the maternal DNA, shows a strong affinity with um, Western Mediterranean, Western European um, type of DNA, which is not surprising at all that, you know, Iberian stock or whatever it was. So that is precisely what you might expect uh, from anybody, you know, in groups that are moving around the Mediterranean, that they, you know, they, the DNA can show they are part of a migration, but they're also integrated in the, um, uh, in the place where they're living because people, these settlements grow by mixing with local population. So without whatever the merits of this particular study is, does just, just that, that to say that um, in the end it doesn't matter <laughs> because these people didn't know what their DNA was uh, the same way that, I don't know, a Greek American might not know what their DNA is and they have an identity shaped by the community in which they live their, their family, their perception of their family history, the religion they practice, the language they speak, and so on and so forth. So for all we know, Matan and, and uh, our friend here from Birsa were uh, as Phoenician as anybody in their community, or they might have known that part of their family was from a local group that was more different than others, or we, we cannot know. But it's just what you might expect. So the Phoenicians strike back, <laughs> and by that I meant that I, I feel like there has been a surge of, of Phoenician studies, not only in archaeology, which had never really stopped, but in, in terms of um, historical uh, studies and the prominence that they take in, in, in books um, and, you know, uh, yeah in books and, exhibit, book, books and museum exhibits and all kinds of things. This is just a, uh, one sample, one of them produced here. <laughs> uh, they connected Iron Age by our colleagues. Uh, so there is a search in protagonism, especially because they have a, a big place, a big role to, to play in um, areas such as Mediterranean studies, which is by itself, like Mediterranean history as a thing, it has become a, a whole field. Um, you can think of the Corrupting Sea and all those sorts of books. Um, also in Iron Age archaeology in general, um, and, and then also in art historical studies about this particular art produced in the early first millennium, all across the, the Levant and the Mediterranean, the so-called orientalizing phenomenon that, um, even though it's an, a very unpopular um, nomenclature, orientalizing, it's still used, so I'm going to use it um, until we find a better one. But just to define it, what I did in my book of the Phoenicians and the making, the, Mediterranean, the making of the Mediterranean, what I tried to do was to kind of integrate historical and archaeological de data and narratives and what we know about where the Phoenicians were settled, try to integrate that with the, this wave of orientalizing, quote-unquote, adaptations, right, that many local groups... Um, uh, implemented, let's say, right? So in Greece, in, in Etruria, in Sicily, in Sardinia, in southern Spain, in the Levant itself, in Anatolia, you have this phenomenon um, of kind of a, an influence or an inflection of Levantine-style uh, art and symbology and, and crafts and technologies um, that in my argument, uh, map very well with the presence of, and, and intense activity of the Phoenicians. Again, not only of the Phoenicians, as I make clear, I'm not saying that they were responsible for everything, but emphasizing that they provided a very strong channel for this phenomenon. So I call that the orientalizing kit, uh, defending that it's a vague enough term, that in, in fact it's so vague and kind of 
wrong in a sense because the Orient is not a thing, right? But that in a sense it, it can be positively taken to reflect a kind of a, a cultural wave that whereby the locals who were adapting these things did not necessarily know where these trends were coming from or where these artifacts were coming from, but they would have encountered them via Phoenicians. So that's a kind of a definition that I made, that the Phoenicians profited from the export of a modifiable package of Levantine-style goods and cultural capital, uh, which constituted the basis of what we call the Orientalizing Kit. Um, and in this way, uh, many of these proto-urban co cultures became interconnected also by a visual, and, uh, by a visual language that they adopted. I'm going to run very fast through these uh, slides to just show you what, the type of art that I'm talking about. I'm, I'm not going to stop in there, but, you know, like decoration in, in what is called orientalizing or proto-Corinthian or archaic, depending on the place. Archaeo Cypriot or uh, Etruscan archaic pottery or whatever, uh, sphinxes, animals, a lot of the type of decoration that was already part of the Canaanite and Phoenician uh, repertoire um, in other uh, art forms. Uh, ivories, and you, you will see a recurrent theme of symbolic elements such as the sphinxes, the lotus flowers, the mistress of animals, all these kinds of things existed in Canaanite culture, and uh, I, my argument is that the Phoenicians, as Canaanites that they were, um, are the ones that kind of sold, let's say, and uh, provided models to be adapted in different ways that already had this synthesis of Egyptian-looking and Assyrian-looking and Syrian-looking elements that were already synthesized in Canaanite culture, such as in the image of the Sphinx, uh, or in the motif of the volute capital or the volute uh, regenerative palm or, um, you know, tree of life and all those sorts of elements that appear all over the place or the kind of hieratic statue uh, that we see also in the Mediterranean. This is a, every one of these things is like a whole topic. <laughs> There's a lot of discussion behind uh, any of this. And I have made some incursions in these art historical uh, topics, partnering sometimes with art historians because it's, you know, these are uh, kind of difficult topics. Another uh, famous area is the writing system that I mentioned before that spread to, um, to Greece, of course, and to Etruria, to the Levant, Israel, uh, Amon, Jordan, like all this, uh, the Phoenician alphabet that was that was a version of an earlier Canaanite alphabet, they are the ones who kind of standardized it, and that is the alphabet that is spread in the Mediterranean. That, there's no question about that. Um, despite that fact, it turns out that, again, paradoxically, we have very little by means of Phoenician literature. Uh, I wrote a synthesis of what we do have, or the genres, the kinds of genres that others, authors, Greeks and Romans, talk about, telling us that the Phoenicians were known for these types of writing. Uh, travel uh, literature, um, even possible connections with pre-Socratic philosophy and cosmogony and so on, uh, but also navigation, agricultural treatises, uh, politics, law, possibly, Carthage, the Carthaginian constitution was uh, very well known by Aristotle, and so on. So it, it, it is very tragic and dramatic that we have lost all that, and we owe that to the Romans who destroyed Carthage. <laughs> of course, those Romans <laughs> destroyed Carthage in um, 146 BCE, same year that they destroyed Corinth. But as I used to say, as I always say, well, the the outcomes of those destructions were kind of opposite. Like, they destroyed Corinth in the same year, but they adopted Greek culture and literature and cherished it, right, like their own. Uh, whereas for Carthage, they dismantled their library, they gave it away, and they tried to do their best to kind of bury um, the Carthaginian, which is Phoenician, um, heritage as much as they could because they were, you know, mortal rivals. So, uh, big question, how do they manage to build and sustain for centuries such an expansive network? Again, from, I'm, I'm talking about from the 9th century BCE to, um, well, to the 2nd century, well, 
the third century, let's be fair, the Punic Wars, that was pretty much it. Uh, the third century BCE, by 500 BC, they really clashed, came into competition uh, with Rome, or Rome came into competition with them in the Western Mediterranean, and that's what led to the Punic Wars. But before that, the interesting thing is that we have this huge network that is, again, not apparently centralized in any way that we can know for sure. We don't know how these cities were connected. We know they were connected by trade, and we see that in, the, in a lot of the material culture. And there are some sources that talk about the connection between Gadir here, Cadiz, and Tyre in terms of religion, the cult of Melkart and Herak Heracles slash Melkart. The god Melkart became uh, synthesized with Heracles, so they have these famous temples of that god. There was a, a connection between Carthage and Tyre. There are foundation stories about these cities being founded by, by Tyre. So there is a symbolic connection across the, the Phoenician Oikumene, but it is kind of, uh, there is a lot still to be learned and, and um, interpreted and, uh, about how it worked exactly and, and what was the role of the mother cities uh, in this diaspora. How long did it last? How much of a grip did they have in, in, in these colonies, if any? Uh, what was going on in that way? So the case of Iberia, we're getting closer. Um, it's a, very, it's a very interesting one because, well, A, there is a lot of settlements, there are a lot of um, archaeological sites and a lot of work being done in, for this period, and also the, con the contact with this local group that we call Tartessos is pretty well attested, not necessarily totally understood yet, uh, but we know there, is the, there, there, there was this... Um, say, late, let's say, Bronze Age European type um, local culture that came into contact with the Phoenicians and then became much more visible. So that's the area of Tartessos. Here you have the colony of Tyre, Gadir, sorry. And, and then pay attention to this. I will show you a close-up of this. So there's Seville is around here, Cordoba is around here. So this is the Guadalquivir Valley, which is a very fertile valley. And all along the, the coast, uh, we have Phoenician settlements. Our Malaga settlement, this keeps happening, is here, around here. And these are the Straits of Gibraltar, which are very difficult to cross, and the Phoenicians clearly knew how to do it, and they banked on that, and they took an advantage um, over other people by trading with this group very early on. So we know about the Tartessic culture, that they were very rich in metals, they, they were exploiting metals since earlier on, but then when the Phoenicians arrive, their culture kind of explodes in terms of chrono um, technology, of metal extraction, metal like filigree and granulation, all these techniques that they apply to their jewelry. They start building sanctuaries, uh, such as this one, which may be Tartessic, may be Phoenician. There is a statue of uh, Ashtart found around there with a Phoenician inscription. There is some debate about what it is, but also the quote-unquote orientalizing influence reaches very far inland. And we have sites like um, Canchorroano and others that present very clear Levantine-style architecture and structures and material culture, even in the 5th century and, and, and the 4th century BCE. So there's, there's an impact of this Levantine culture that stays in and kind of penetrates right, the, the, the local culture until much later. So what were they doing in this area? One interesting fact, obviously, is the metal, metal resources. So the area of Huelva, which is around here, this is the, the gulf that I pointed before, um, is one of the most, one of the richest concentration of metals uh, like in the world, apparently. These are the Rio Tinto mines. Uh, they were exploited until, the, until, until now, but especially until the 19th century, I think. Um, during Roman times as well, and so on. This is like, this area is like, like Mars. Like, it's called Rio Tinto, like Red River, for a reason, which is, it looks like this. If you go like, to there, like it's, you're thinking, you think you're in a different planet, and it's because of the metals, especially the iron. But they have silver, iron, tin, copper, um, a lot of stuff. So the Phoenicians knew what they were doing, and they came here very early, but... Here you have a, a concentration of um, 
sites that are more like local driven, like lo marked by local pottery that is indigenous handmade pottery, uh, indigenous style metalwork, and so on. Then they become orientalizing. They start producing materials that are more Levantine-like, but the Phoenicians don't set a colony here. However, there are Phoenician materials here in Huelva, even burials, but not like a settlement. That, to me, means that this community was strong enough that they were not taking any, they were not letting them sit, settle there, but they were giving them access to their uh, mineral resources and so on. So there is a partnership. Uh, we don't know with how much pressure or violence or not. There is no indication of colonization in that way. However, the Phoenicians decide to settle here in Cadiz, right? So they're, sorry, this keeps moving. They are at the other side of the, um, so here's Huelva. Here is the entrance of the Guadalquivir Valley, which nowadays is um, silted. Like this is the Doñana Park, if anybody likes birds, <laughs> famous birding. Uh, marshes, right? But in antiquity, we know, and also from prospections, archaeological prospections, that this was, in fact, as the sources say, a, a, a gulf, and it was open, which means it explains why there are so many sites along this, what was uh, the gulf. There are many Iron Age sites, local and, and with a lot of Phoenician materials as well, all the way up to Seville, which is somewhere here. So, there is some sort of divide where you see the kind of the local stronghold. That is my interpretation, at least, and that of a lot of scholars. And then they settle closer to the Straits here in Cadiz. And here's where they, you have a concentration of, Phoenician, um, of a Phoenician city. And there's where you get uh, one of the earliest Phoenician settlements. This is not our site, but what lies under the city of Cadiz nowadays, which is a very impressive block, it's not more than that, it's just a block, it's an emergency excavation and they're a theater, but in that block they have found the, you know, the earliest uh, stratum of, of, of the foundation of Cadiz, which goes back to the late 9th century BCE. So there's an interesting discussion about the chronology, because every time something else is discovered, and, or there, and there's some carbon 14 done, and this and that, and pottery compared between tires, tires pottery and Phoenician pottery here, it seems every now, you know, it confirms the early presence in full-fledged mode of urbanization of the Phoenicians in this area, which for, I say this because for, for a long time, people were very skeptical that the sources were right. They were pointing to the late 9th century, foundation of Carthage is 418, 440, no, sorry, 814, uh, 814 BC in, in the sources. And um, nobody believed that because they hadn't found that. But now there are plenty of sites that go back to, to, this, um, to this time. And this is just a, a map of, um, again, to situate you where we are. Here is uh, Huelva and Cadiz on the other side of the Gulf. And here at this, on this side of the Straits is where Malaga is with these two sites that, that we are, have been um, engaging with. Cerro del Villar is where that big dot is. <laughs> but also, more importantly, there is another little site just inland from it, just a little bit farther inland that is even earlier and shows that earlier phase of contact with the locals uh, in the late 9th century. So let's move on to the Cerro del Villar before I run out of time and show you very quickly um, uh, some of what, what has been going on there and why this, this site is so important. But I have to mention um, the, the collaboration with our colleagues from Malaga, the University of Malaga. This is really a, 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 a huge collaboration project. Uh, here you have both, both teams and uh, my co-director, Professor Davis Long, who is here, and our PI, Professor Jose Suarez Padilla from the University of Malaga. Besides other colleagues from Malaga and from all over Spain and from Germany and from other places who are doing something or other related to the project. He has you know, really brought together a lot of experts in many areas, um, but let's say our two teams are the ones that are digging. Um, I, have to show, I have to show my guys from last summer, <laughs> some of whom are here uh, in this very nice photo of the Chicago team. And this photo, which is so much more fun. <laughs> I will pass quickly. <laughs> so the Cerro del Villar uh, is in the Bay of Malaga. Here is the, the city of Malaga today. 
um, and just outside of the city, of today's city, in one of the mouth, in the mouth of one of the rivers, the Guadalhorce, uh, there was this larger gulf, again, that has been silted, and our site was here, one little island, one of several little islands in, the la in, in this mouth. The earlier site was here, so, but excavations were very uh, fast because the site is under the airport, so there's, but it was enough to see that, um, that there was an earlier phase of contact and an earlier phase of even building. We don't know building what, if it was a site, a settlement, or a sanctuary, some people think. Uh, I will pass over the history of the site kind of quickly, though just to show you here, you have you can see the shape of the, of the island. Now all of this is land. You will see a photo. The river is channel, channeled, channel, canalized very uh, strictly because, this is very important, this river has many Mediterranean, like dry climate rivers. It's tiny, but it's kind of a seasonal river. So when it rains, it pours, and then there is not enough, you know, uh, moist and vegetation to hold to the water, so it floods. And that happens in a lot of Mediterranean places, right? So we'll get to that. And this is the airport excavation uh, of the other site farther inland, and now the site is under runway number three, I think. <laughs> right? This is very sad. <laughs> but anyway, perhaps one day they'll decide to repave it, and we'll just go right there. But just to show you the variety of things that would come up in this sort of, of place, but you have geomet Greek geometric pottery, and you have, a, a, I think this is a Sardinian type of pot, and typical red slip wear uh, jug. Um, not sure what this is, <laughs> a little, little sculpture, and uh, yeah, and transport jar jugs and so on. Uh, so it's the kind of thing that also allows you to compare with chronology, right? Like geometric pottery is pretty well pretty well uh, dated, though still a bit debated sometimes, and you can then, that also helps date things. This is a, a map of the site where it is nowadays with the, this area marked up, uh, you know, digitally so you can see, and these are the excavations. This is where we have been, well, we have been digging around here. But all of this is like, what, eight hectares of, ter of terrain, miraculously, in southern coastal Spain, not built over. Why? <laughs> Well, in part because the area floods, and it still floods, so it's not good. The Phoenicians for once, maybe not once, maybe other times, did not choose too well. So they stayed here for about two centuries, and then they left. And when they left, they probably moved to where Malaga is now, because that's when Malaga starts getting built, built up, and we have uh, bigger defensive walls and more uh, materials there. So we think that they... This is kind of the proto-Malaga, perhaps. So the area is slightly elevated, but not very, and then now it's a protected area for bird nesting and stuff like that, which is great, because it's not built over. You can think of the prototype of the Phoenician settlement um, at the mouth, again, at the mouth of, a, of a, an estuary in archipelago mode. Here is a, a digitally retouched uh, map of uh, photo of Cadiz. Nowadays, this is not a real channel, but analysis of the soil and so on has de detected that this was most likely a channel between these two islands. Um, this is a reconstruction of Tyre. So you, ca you have Cadiz here, Cadiz today, um, yeah, to get an idea, but these were separate islands. So the comparison with Tyre is great, you know, and many other sites of the Phoenicians, like Mozia, uh, I mean, there's just a lot of them, or peninsulas like Carthage. That's a typical uh, MO. So the colony almost mirroring the mother, right, the, the mother city. Um, and then all sorts of studies can be done nowadays with analysis, archaeological analysis, lab, like lab work, which is amazing. So in one of the, uh, one of the studies of the, of the seeds and soil and so on shows this analysis from my colleague from Malaga also, Manuel Alvarez. Uh, the colony dominated a hinterland that produced a significant volume of cereals, 64%, legumes, vines, and olives, Mediterranean diet, right, in fields far from the site and probably in the hands of the indigenous population. It is estimated that the site may have controlled a resource collection radius of around 18 kilometers, focused on the lower and middle course of the Guadalhorce River, the little river. 
Um, that's just from analyzing the type of products you, you get. So we're hoping to do much more of that. Uh, in the early excavations in the 1990s, the site was excavated and um, just like 5%, maybe 10% at most, um, but enough to see that it was a fully urbanized area. Uh, this is a reconstruction of the so-called commercial street that they excavated then, dated to the early 8th century BC, which is when we think the, the settlement starts. And you have the typical, you know, rectilinear um, streets, I mean, houses around streets where you have a combination of... Um, a combination of, um, of uh, technology, te uh, what's the word, workshops, right? Workshops and metalworking installations and pottery production installations and market and houses, probably houses serving several purposes, like with one floor, the lower floor as the commercial one and the upper floor for the houses uh, and so on. So it's, this is very really exciting because now we are actually excavating just west of this uh, and kind of expanding on this commercial area. And um, here's some of the things they found to support what, what I just said. Um, their reading of the site as, as um, commercial and uh, metallurgical um, in, in activity. Some uh, weights marked with the sheen for shekel, right? Uh, uh, two years for metal production and uh, ovens in another area close to, the, to this area. They found this tanur style oven that are exactly like those found in uh, Sarepta and other sites in, in Lebanon from the same period. So again, they are transporting uh, some, some areas of their technology just, just exactly like they know how to do it. They have, they have the know-how to make all this pro production uh, in a different place. And at the same time, very soon, you have new types of pottery and new, probably new new, you know, new costumes, uh, new food perhaps, um, who knows about clothing or anything else, as they mix with the local population, you'll have some transformation. So that's what we want to study. In the 90s, they excavated an area that was alongside the river, um, but I want to move on. Uh, one of our colleagues did this very cool uh, digital uh, modeling of, of, of house two, which is great, and he also made the interior and the exterior and so on. And then uh, to move forward, how these current excavations started was very briefly uh, via a study of this inundation uh, issue <laughs> that they had that I mentioned. So our colleagues from Malaga and, and some colleagues from, um, from Aachen in Germany who are experts in tsunamis and inundations, they planned this study of reopening one of the cats, uh, cat five from, from the previous excavations, and doing a full study of the strata uh, of all the deposits to try to ascertain what had happened with this inundation. So this was part of a project about extreme wave events in the Western Mediterranean, and they found, and now they have published some of the data, they have found actually that it was true what the original excavator proposed that there was a very big layer of an inundation, uh, which you can see here. This is the remains of an adobe wall. And, and, and she had said, Maria Eugenia Obed, that, that she thought that this was an inundation, maybe from the river, maybe from the sea. So now they have detected this and actually another one over here that they have dated them to the 7th century, one early 7th century, another in the late 7th century. So we know that at least there were two big inundations. They think one of them was from the river mostly and that the second one was from the sea. And it's incredible the amount of data that, that these studies can can give you as, as to the strength of the, how the water comes in, the timing, how, for how long, all kinds of stuff. So that's kind of how it started, and then we put together this larger project uh, and said, okay, this place needs to be excavated again. And that's where we came in. Here you have an electro, a magnetometry of the site where you can see that it's really very built up. Um, and these are the areas where we dug last year. And this year we did a bit more here, and here the Spanish team, and here's our team. So just to show you a very few cool things 
uh, from last year um, that speak about daily life. Basically, we're excavating foundations of houses, maybe houses slash workshops. We have not reached so many floors yet. We are kind of getting there to ascertain the function of the, of the complexes. But there are some very cool things that, that connect the site to you know, sea life, as you might expect of Phoenicians. So you have like a whole banquet of, of, uh, of seashells, like a whole paella remain that somebody <laughs> threw in there, murex shells that were used to make a purple dye, famous production of the Phoenicians, uh, a sail, uh, fisherman's uh, hook, a piece of an anchor, a boat anchor, which is very cool. Um, and corresponds with certain types that appear in the Levant and through the Phoenician world. Um, and moving on to, to wrap up with the, to the 2023 excavation, just to show you the awesome ortho photo that Andrew Wright made. Um, and you can see that there are several layers going on, and this is part of, this is just west of uh, the sector with the, the commercial street. That well, actually, the commercial street is here somewhere around here. We think that some of, these are, some of this area also has signs of a thermal installation or ovens. I'm just going to show you some pictures for fun to wrap it up with some people that you know. There's so many more that you also know. But here's Marta, who is right now in Iraq, digging at Nippur. And here's Charles. Um, and you can see that, well, we made some probes to see how far down it goes, and it just keeps going. So we know that the 8th century the 8th century uh, layer is uh, below here, and we're trying to still figure out uh, how below and, and how to proceed, but here you can see the same, like there's another wall down here, and in this area, um, the commercial street is here, uh, is where we think there is some good signs of uh, ovens, like these are adobe walls of some kind of installation, and here is a piece of adobe with some, Samantha. Uh, and some really awesome assemblages of pottery that Alison and, other, and, and Charles have been working on already in Malaga. Um, some of them kind of smashed against a wall. Again, was it because of the inundation? Where is the inundation? We, don't, we have to try to match our record in this part of the town with the record of the pit that was open where they detected the inundation and they gave it a dating and all because it's in a different area. There is a bit of a slope, so we have to still figure out how everything matches. But this is very interesting, as is the bench, or whatever it is, where Kate here is, uh, is lying, because it's, this is an adobe uh, thing, you can see here, uh, that is under and kind of leaning against this wall, or this wall is leaning on it, or we don't know. So is it a bench? Is it another wall that is, was like an adobe wall on which another wall has been built? Uh, there's all sorts of theories. Uh, and we don't know yet, but you can see that, it, that there's really, first of all, it's a site where you dig and you're right there. Like you dig for 50 centimeters and you're already digging the foundations of, of the upper level and then you keep going and there is a lot of material uh, to go through. These are not the only aspects of the, of the, of the project. Like for instance, there was another uh, uh, German team who were digging a fish salt, salt fish installation this is just like half of one of the pools. This is a huge installation of like 10 of these pools or more from late Roman times. And we were amazed at their very neat profiles that they, <laughs> that they had. Uh, there is some random things like Hellenistic period jag. Like what is it doing in a seventh century, what we thought was a seventh century context, but it's kind of at the end. Is that like brought up by the water, like they at some later period, which would mean this was some sort of beach or beaching area or harbor area. Uh, a lot of stuff. So to finish, and with this, just give, I just gave you a very, very uh, sweeping overview, enough to, I hope, to get your interest. But one of the fascinating questions, besides the larger question that I, that I, that I laid out about the mode of settlement, right? What is this network? How do they sustain the network? Uh, how is it connected to the Levant and to other parts of the network? But one of the fascinating things, too, is about the landscape, land, landscape archaeology, all these issues of sustainability that are so, you know, so central in a lot of archaeological work. So, as my colleague uh, wrote this, the, uh, the economic activity of the settlement may have partially contributed to the degradation of the immediate environment and the gradual process of flooding of the estuary. So, if you're cutting trees like crazy to feed 
with wood, those ovens and those metal installations, right, and do metal work and build ships and all kinds of things, you are degrading the landscape and therefore when it rains, it will flood. So by the end of the seventh century, the island was on the verge of disappearing, surrounded by marshes and riverbeds in the midst of an inhospitable and hugely vulnerable landscape. And true enough, they picked up and left. Uh, and they left and there was some uh, pottery making activity for a while, like it was like an industrial area, which is what it is right now as well, uh, interestingly. But definitely there is, a, there is a lot to be learned here also in terms of these questions of how do they engage how did, with the landscape, how did they transform the landscape, how did that affect their, their survival and their viability of their sites. So I'm going to uh, leave it there only with a conclusion of that Plato, well, um, Plato is quoted as saying that those who want a well-governed city ought to shun the sea as a teacher of vice, that is the, the idea of the corrupting sea. But actually that's from Plato's laws who says that it is best not to be too close to the sea but not to be too far from it because a lot of new things come from the sea that people, new people, new merchandise that can be kind of corrupting of your character. So anyway, I like to say that the Phoenicians are the most corrupting uh, of peoples perhaps in the Mediterranean, but not for the worse, but for uh, also a lot, of, uh, you know, a lot of good things that we're still learning about. Thank you. <laughs>